Well, thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, I appreciate you coming to listen uh, um, to some of the work I did as part of my master's research at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So many species of birds migrate each fall and spring to seek out better food resources, as well as areas for breeding. And this figure depicts the migration of a black pole warbler and the lines represent their migration paths. So as you can see, migratory songbirds travel thousands of kilometers between their breeding and wintering areas where they expend large amounts of energy and encounter risks along the way, such as competition and predation from other animals, human-made impediments like buildings and artificial light, and lack of suitable habitat to stop and find food before they continue on with their migration. And migration consists of two parts, stopover and movement. Because these birds fly over such large distances to reach their breeding and wintering grounds, they're required to stop along the way to rest and replenish their fat reserves at what are called stopover sites. And the largest amount of energy a bird expends during migration occurs not in flight, but actually at stopover, where they balance the risks of encountering predators while scouting out unfamiliar territories and moving around stopover sites to find suitable resources. And then movement involves migrants leaving these stopover or breeding and wintering areas shortly after sunset, migrating into the early morning hours where they typically move in broad movements with flocks of other, other individuals. And understanding the full life cycle of a migratory bird is important because each individual part can influence the next. So studies have shown that successful migrations can carry over to promote successful breeding seasons. So for example, if these birds are able to access high quality food resources during migration, they then have a better chance of arriving at their breeding grounds in good body condition. That makes them more competitive on the breeding grounds. And then they may secure territories and begin breeding earlier than others. And studies have also shown that birds with higher fuel or fat loads at stopover may have the ability to migrate faster because they have more energy reserves than those with less fat, which again could result in those individuals arriving um, at their breeding sites as, as soon as possible to begin their breeding season. And so these findings highlight the importance of stopover sites, given what a big impact they can have to the rest of their annual cycle. And then in turn, successful breeding seasons allow birds to leave areas up north to take advantage of food resources in the spring as they make their way south um, and then arrive at their wintering grounds in good condition to secure and defend territories earlier than other migrants. And so when looking at all parts of their annual cycle, which include the breeding, wintering, and migration seasons, the migratory period is one of the most poorly understood because it's more difficult to track and monitor them as they travel over such broad spatial scales. And migratory birds are facing steep declines, which is why it's crucial that researchers work to better our understanding of their needs. We've lost 2.5 billion migratory birds since the 1970s. And some of the factors that contribute to these declines inc include habitat loss and habitat fragmentation along migration routes. And because songbirds encounter a variety of obstacles and risks during migration, a study by Scylla and Holmes found that survival of black-throated blue warblers was lowest during the migratory period compared to the breeding and wintering periods, which is demonstrated in the figure on the right with the numbers next to each season representing survival probability. And several other studies have also found that the highest annual mortality occurs during migration. And so because of this, the study of migration is key to understanding and supporting migratory species. And so even further, we find that inland migration is understudied, meaning that migration studies occur at geographic barriers, such as urban areas, coastlines, and lake shores, because large volumes of birds concentrate along these areas in fall and spring. And these areas may provide food resources for birds looking to make long migrations or serve as their last stop before making over water flights, crossing oceans or lakes. However, these sites along the coast may also be intensely crowded, 
which increases the risk of competition and predation from other animals. And research has shown that subsets of birds captured along the coast make inland flights away from the coast, looking for less crowded refueling sites with higher quality food resources that may result in better overall body condition, meaning that they can put on more fat and that the mortality may be lower at these inland sites as well. And so although migrating birds at inland sites may be less concentrated than coastal sites, they still may concentrate their movements or activities in relation to geographic barriers, such as mountain ranges or river valleys. And so river valleys and mountain ranges can provide birds with navigational aids to help account for wind drift as the birds are flying, as well as sources of high quality areas for refueling, such as riparian or floodplain habitats, they may be surrounded by urban or arid regions lacking in food resources. And then broad scale movements at stopovers within river valleys have been relatively understudied. And so identifying patterns of movement and factors that may influence migratory behaviors can help us understand more about this vital life stage during migration. And so our study wanted to look at how um, migratory bird birds behave at inland sites and particularly within the Silvio Oconte National Fish and Wildlife Refuge, which is pictured in the map in the middle. So this refuge stretches from the coast of Connecticut to the border of Canada, and it's a large ecosystem based refuge in that it encompasses the entire Connecticut River watershed, which is shown in the blue on the map. And there was a previous study conducted within the refuge in the 1990s um, in spring that used point count surveys to look at how birds were using the refuge. And so they observed that there were more birds and more species at the southern end of the refuge in Connecticut. And then that number decreased as they surveyed sites uh, into the north in Vermont and New Hampshire. And so they also found that birds were observed at sites closer to the river which could be because the river may provide more food resources during spring due to warmer temperatures, lower in, in elevation, which results in earlier vegetation growth. And so this study was very informative with regards to how birds are using the refuge during migration, but some questions still remain about how they may be using stopover sites, what influences how long they stay to help better understand their habitat needs at a species level, as well as where individuals go once they leave, and then how their stopover sites may influence the rest of their migration. And so our specific objectives were to look at, overall, how are migratory birds using the Silvio Oconte National Fish and Wildlife Refuge during migration? So how long are they stopping and where are they going once they leave? As well as how the resources within the refuge are influencing their migration and stopovers. So questions like how long um, do they stop and how fast do they migrate and what may be influencing why those behaviors are occurring, as well as if there are areas or habitat types that may be more or less beneficial to these species as they try and find areas for refueling within the refuge during migration. And so to answer these questions, we turn to the MODIS wildlife tracking system. And this technology is relatively new and allows researchers to more efficiently monitor and track birds um, compared to previous methods going, um, of going out and surveying birds using point counts or other satellite or GPS trackers that may um, require you to capture the bird to get that data back. And so this technology involves putting up tracking stations, which are essentially radio towers, as seen in the figure uh, in the middle. And so each individual blue dot you see on this map represents a tracking station, which is set up by researchers with their own questions and objectives, but it creates this collaborative effort by allowing us to all um, use this technology and so that birds from any project may be detected on these towers using this technology. Um, so this allows us to expand the scale of our studies. And so the way that we're able to track these birds is by using small transmitters called nanotags, which can be seen on the Swainson's thrush in this figure. 
And then these transmitters send out coded messages to the tracking stations that are unique to each bird so that we can identify in each individual bird as they fly by a tower. And so for our project, we set up 12 of these tracking stations along a 160 kilometer stretch of the Connecticut River and the Refuge throughout Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont, which are represented by the dots on the map in the middle. And the red dots indicate where we captured birds at our banning sites, which also had tracking stations. And so these tracking stations stand roughly 30 feet tall, and we place them in areas with wide open views like fields, mountain summits, and fire towers to ensure that we get the maximum detection distance around these towers to detect birds as they fly by or stop to use the habitats nearby. And the photo on the left is an example of one of our freestanding towers on a mountain summit. And the photo to the right is one of the fire towers that we affixed the um, antennas to the top of the, um, of the fire tower. And so after we set up these tracking stations, we then captured birds using fine mesh nets called mist nets, and then, uh, which is pictured in the photo to the left. And then we recorded morphological data on these birds and took standard measurements to get some information about the species, um, like the sex, um, the age, its wing and bill length, et cetera. And then next we put these small transmitters or nanotags on our focal species as pictured in the back of the bird, on the back of the bird in the photo to the right. And then the middle of the photo depicts the start of the attachment process. And so our focal species included the 10 species shown here, the black pole warbler, the Canada warbler, the yellow rumped warbler, northern water thrush, Swainson's thrush, Lincoln sparrow, white-throated sparrow, oven bird, red-eyed vireo, and wood thrush. And we chose these species because they're representative species of the Northeast region, as well as species that represent them. And so understanding their needs will help other declining migratory birds in this region. And we made sure to only tag migratory species that don't breed within the area so that when we release them, they would give us um, tracking data and when they would leave the area eventually to continue with their migration. So in spring, this list was condensed to a smaller suite of species, leaving out birds that would breed in the area, like wood thrush, oven birds, and red-eyed vireos, for example. And then in fall, we were able to tag all of these birds as we knew they would leave after the breeding season. And so after we went out and put these nano tags on the birds and collected data, we were able to use it to calculate how long a bird stayed at a site, which was the stopover duration. And we did this by taking the minimum and maximum times the bird was at a site by looking at their daily movements. So in this figure to the left um, is an example of a bird moving around the site. So the um, these spikes in the graph show its daily movements. Um, and so the gaps between those represent nighttime when it's not moving around. And so we were also be able to, uh, able to calculate migration rate. So how fast they moved once they left. We did this by using the time between detections of other towers. As I had mentioned earlier, there was that broad map of all of the other towers located around the Northeast. And so the figure on the right depicts the migration path of one of our birds. Um, it was a Swainson thrush, thrush traveling from uh, Massachusetts to Nova Scotia. And I won't get into the weeds too much about how I derived these metrics, um, because there's a lot more that went into it and it's not super exciting, but I'm happy to chat with anyone later um, who is interested. And so the tracking data can give us information about stopover and movement behaviors and what influences those behaviors. But to look at types of habitats migrants are selecting during stopover at a finer scale, we also conducted point count surveys. And so these bird surveys were conducted at 11 sites pictured on the map to the right. And the point counts for our study involved going to these selected points at each of the sites within our survey area and counting birds we saw and heard in a 14 minute span. And an example of what the, the vis a visual of what the survey may look like 
um, is the photo to the left. The large outside circle represents a 50 meter radius around the center point where we stood and uh, conducted our survey. And so we only included birds within that 50 meter radius for um, our survey to ensure that the birds we observed at that point were in fact using that habitat. And then we repeated these surveys at least three times during fall and spring during migration. And to understand what kinds of habitats these birds were using and to better promote and protect those types of habitats, all of our surveys had three distinct habitat types at each site. So all of our sites had points in open, open shrubland habitats, forest edge habitats, as well as forest interior habitats to see where migrants were most abundant and what types of habitats they were using the most. And the species we chose to study for our point count analysis were the ruby crowned kinglet, the yellow rumped warbler, and the yellow palm warbler. And these species were those that we had large enough samples and counts for to conduct our analysis. Um, and most importantly, they were birds that don't breed within our study area. So we can understand how migratory species are using these habitats. So before I jump into the results, I will just um, restate the first objective so we can orient us a little bit. So how are migratory songbirds using the refuge? So what did we find? We found that birds are using the refuge differently depending on spring and fall. So birds captured in spring made shorter stopovers and migrated faster compared to fall. And these seasonal differences uh, are well documented in other studies because spring birds may be under more pressure than fall birds to migrate quickly to reach their breeding grounds and begin their season. So that can uh, so that they can produce offspring compared to fall when that pressure is a little bit more relaxed. And so to understand how these individuals may or may not have used the refuge once they left the banning sites, this slide shows the movement tracks of each bird leaving the banning site in spring 2015 and 2016. And to orient you, the Connecticut River runs roughly north and south of the area on the map that the main points originate from. So in spring, we found a very small portion of our birds traveled through our entire array. Um, but so to get an idea of whether or not they used the river at all once they left, um, I we found that some birds initially went to the coast, 29% of them, um, but most continued the river for varying distances. Um, so, but overall, our results are showing um, similar trends to the previous study that I had talked about initially, um, saying that a larger number of individuals and species were using the southern end of the refuge compared to um, sites further north. And again, this could be the result of early leaf out um, further south when you think about when things start to bloom in spring, which in turn relates to food availability. And then this slide shows the same movement tracks of birds from the banning site, but in fall. So the majority of our fall migrants followed the river once they departed the banning site, and then a small portion went to the coast. So this indicates that in both seasons, a significant portion of these migrants used the Conti for stopover, as well as a possible corridor to navigate to the coast in fall. And so we did find also that once the birds left our banning site, about 50% of them were detected along the coastline in the area highlighted in the box on this map. So we observed fall migrants making additional long stopovers of up to 20 days um, near the mouth of the river here as it empties out into Long Island Sound. And so these sites also may be influential to these migrants journeys because for birds making long over water flights like black pole warblers, for example, and maybe their last opportunity to refuel. And so the sites within our study area provided the resources for them to refuel in order to get to these coastal sites to make additional stopovers. And then we also found that stopover durations varied by species. And that within species, uh, behaviors also varied among seasons. 
So these figures represent the stopover durations of all species in spring and fall. So for example, we found that yellow rumped warblers made long stopovers in both spring and fall, with individuals stopping um, of up to, or making stopovers of up to 16 days. Whereas um, Swainson's thrush made relatively short stopovers in spring and then longer stopovers in fall. So this highlights the importance of understanding species specific needs and that behaviors within a species may change seasonally depending on the resources available, as well as what strategies they adopt during migration. And then we found similar species with our migration rate data. So we found that yellow rumped warblers traveled at extremely slow paces in both seasons. And so having a very slow migration rate suggests that they made additional stopovers that our tracking data couldn't capture because we didn't have towers blanketing the entire area. So there were gaps between. So this may suggest that they're making, again, additional long stopovers as they travel to their breeding in winter and grounds in fall and spring, which is um, which could be reflecting their migration strategy. Compared to Swainson's thrush that traveled at very slow rates in spring, again, suggesting additional stopovers within our study area that we weren't able to capture. And then they traveled at faster sustained paces during fall. So again, these differences highlight the different strategies that species undertake, as well as how they change seasonally. And so um, that's important also to consider during uh, these differing strategies when thinking about protecting and promoting areas and resources that these species need because they may change depending on the season as well as the species. And so switching back to our stopover results, we found that many of the individuals made prolonged stopovers of a week or more, which is thought to surpass the time that birds need to refuel. And other studies have found that birds making these prolonged stopovers suggest that they are using these sites to rest and refuel before making long overwater um, or long flights or long overwater flights across barriers potentially. And so our results may suggest that birds behaving similarly inland using these sites to fuel up for long distance flights as well. And so because coastal landscapes are becoming increasingly more developed, protecting habitat inland that may be beneficial to these species as well is equally as important. And so then looking back at our other objective, how do the resources within the refuge influence their migrations or stopovers? We found that birds with smaller amounts of fat measured when we captured them and lower weights made longer stopovers than those with more fat initially. So this suggests that birds chose to stay at these sites within the refuge to find food resources rather than leave and find other suitable habitat elsewhere. So these birds are choosing to stay and find food within the refuge and their choice to, uh, to stay suggests that these sites are in fact providing that food for them. Um, and so this finding is also consistent with other migration research that suggests that fat on a bird is one of the main determinants of how long they stay. And um, because it is the main priority of why they're at stopover is to refuel and continue on to the next leg of their journey. And so one of the last results I presented indicated that many of these individuals engaged in these longer prolonged stopovers. And so we also found that longer stopovers were related to faster migration rates in our fall study. And so on this figure, you can see stopover duration on the X axis along the bottom and on, all along the Y axis on the left is migration rate. So birds that stayed longer migrated faster which suggests that they were able to use these stopover sites within the refuge to fuel up and help promote a more successful migration. And then we also found in spring that birds captured with lower masses and, well, actually that slide is in there twice. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
OK, so then moving on to the last objective. Are there areas or habitat types that may be more or less beneficial to these species? So we have found that the abundance of these three focal species that we looked at um, was greater in shrubland and edge habitats compared to inland interior um, forest habitats. And so I'm showing two species here as examples. And so although the presence of a species during migration doesn't necessarily indicate habitat quality, studies of migratory songbirds at stopover suggest that habitat use may be highly influenced by habitat quality and food availability. And so these edge and shrubland habitats may be providing habitat, um, high quality habitat for these species. And then we also found that migrant abundance also differed among seasons as well. So the specifics of these figures are just to illustrate the point that um, yellow rumped warblers, for example, were most abundant at different sites between fall and spring um, for the same species. So these differences among fall and spring may speak to the changing resources at a site between spring and fall. And then this slide reflects our results, suggesting that abundance um, also differed among sites. So yellow rumped warblers were most abundant at um, the sites that yellow rumped warblers were most abundant at differ from those of ruby crown kinglets, for example. And so not every site may support all these migrant species, um, considering they were most abundant at different sites. Um, but so in combination, the sites within the refuge are providing habitat for a variety of species. And so to summarize our findings, we found that all of our metrics, stopover duration, the pace at which they travel, and the abundance of these migrants differed by seasons as well as species. And understanding species specific patterns will help better protect them by knowing um, what they need and when. And then we found that lean birds or birds with less body fat chose to stay longer than fatter birds in spring in order to use this refuge to fuel up for the next leg of their migration. And then we found that many birds are making long stopovers within the refuge and that these long stops may be advantageous to allow them to fuel up for long distance flights. And our finding that birds are doing this inland as well on the coast, where inland they're away from a large water body, like an ocean or a lake, suggests that the habitat within the refuge may be providing similar resources um, for these long stops, considering again the rapid development along the coast, um, and it may be beneficial to conserve and protect these inland sites. And then um, migrants in fall that made longer stopovers were able to migrate faster, showing that the resources within the refuge are contributing to the migratory performance of these birds once they leave. And then we found with regards to habitat use, species within our study were most abundant in these open and edge habitats, which is likely due to food availability. So these types of habitats can be promoted and managed for within the refuge to help these species find high quality food along their migration routes. And then so overall, we found that our results suggest the Silvia Oconte National Fish and Wildlife Refuge is providing valuable resources for both stopover and subsequent migrations of these declining species. <laughs>